Thank you very much, Professor Yamaguchi. And actually, I found uh, your presentation uh, to be very good, uh, almost seamless uh, continuation about the deterrence, uh, following up what uh, Mr. Kment said. And actually, I think, uh, and also you touched upon how you see the normative approach to the nuclear uh, weapons and particularly uh, the total ban, uh, ban treaty uh, aspect from military practitioner, practitioner's point of view. And you presented the uh, spectrum of conflicts and deterrence, uh, but I'm quite confident that with these four speakers, including yourself, uh, Professor Yamaguchi, we had really a wide spectrum of experience and views to really kind of address these issues. Not only maybe, uh, you know, listening to what the four speakers said, not only limited to the European or Asian context, but again, following up yesterday's discussion, very global international level too. But at the same time, very interesting points of view are presented in particular uh, by Ambassador Viek and uh, Mr. Kument about the security uh, situation in Europe. And also Professor Taku also touched upon the security situation in Asia Pacific region. Uh, so there are many elements here to start our discussions. Uh, before opening the floor to any questions or comments coming from the general audience, uh, if any of the four speakers, uh, after listening to others, uh, wish to take the floor at this stage, oh yes, Ambassador Vix, please. You are very quick <laughs> to respond to my request. Please go ahead, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much, and I think it's a pretty exciting uh, debate, and I just wanted to refer to uh, three points during the um, presentations to give some clar clarification. The first one is with regard to what uh, Mr. Menit said about the value, the value of nuclear deterrence regarding Russia. I think the question was, why did the nuclear deterrent of NATO uh, did not deter Russia from uh, the insurgence of green man in uh, Crimea. And the simple answer is uh, that Crimea, as part of Ukraine, is not a member of NATO and is not covered uh, by the nuclear umbrella of NATO. So this is, in fact, a good argument to just come to the opposite conclusion, because what we have not seen, fortunately, and, and also due to a credible deterrent, uh, is the green man in Narva or in Riga. Uh, so uh, here you have the uh, a, a difference. Now, uh, do we expect the full invasion of Russian forces in NATO? I would say no, and that's not the point. Uh, it's uh, more that the threatening with nuclear weaponry or with nuclear strikes as part of hybrid warfare has a potential influence on your policy. Uh, so it compromises your sovereignty and the liberty uh, of action and of thinking. Uh, and if you do not want to make this compromise, you are well advised regarding uh, a country with nuclear weapons uh, to have a nuclear deterrent uh, yourself. Summing up, this nuclear, the, the credible deterrent makes you more immune, more resilient against external pressure. And at the same time, I fully subscribe to the ultimate goal uh, to overcome the logic of nuclear deterrence. It, is, it has it, its downsides, and I would not um, uh, ignore them. And therefore, we have to work on the right um, measures to reduce the role of nuclear weapons. And there, I think there was a certain misunderstanding. Uh, in my presentation, I did not say that we have to save the world climate first and fight international terrorism first and then deal with nuclear deterrence. Uh, it was more that if we direct our energies towards these global challenges and if the international community, including uh, the world and the big powers around the globe, uh, are working for a common global uh, goal, then this would be conducive to confidence building. 
among all these nations that apparently uh, are um, um, somehow confronting with each other with a more hegemonic uh, logic uh, at this point in time. So that eventually uh, we will reach more confidence and trust while fighting these global challenges, which th would then be, con be conducive to multilateral arrangements regarding um, disarmament and arms control, confidence building uh, in the area of security. And if, with your permission, one final word on uh, General uh, Yamaguchi on uh, the relevance of nuclear deterrence in, uh, the, in the security doctrines of nations, um, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, if you take a country like India, um, I would not fully subscribe to that uh, assessment. In particular, uh, given the relationship and the, uh, the issues um, between uh, India and China uh, and the overwhelming conventional arsenal of China, I think um, India, uh, with its nuclear deterrent, uh, is in another position as if it had not this nuclear deterrent. Uh, giving India the possibility uh, to oppose uh, to um, China in various fields. And you, self, uh, you yourself mentioned uh, the compensation logic uh, that was prevalent, uh, that prevailed uh, between NATO and the Warsaw Pact in uh, the Cold War. And I think it's true for uh, many theaters around the world. Uh, so I'm not sure whether this... Uh, the nuclear deterrent has become more relevant. I, I would wish it became, and we should uh, all join hands in uh, working for uh, reducing the relevance, but I don't think that we are there yet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Yix. And I think for the matter of fairness, I think all other three speakers should also take the floor just for this round. And then I'll open the floor. So first, Mr. Kment, please. And then I think Ms. Uh, Professor Tucker, you also raised your hand. So first, Mr. Kment, please. Thank you. I just, uh, uh, I just wanted to respond to that uh, because it's a misunderstanding. Of course, I know that uh, Ukraine is not uh, part of NATO. The point I wanted to make, the kind of conflict that we see, what we saw in Ukraine, un, uh, non-official combatants crossing the border, is in a scenario like that, are nuclear weapons an effective deterrent? I think that's a valid question. It's possible, but we don't know. I think a lot is assumed what nuclear deterrence uh, does, but we don't know and we cannot actually prove it. And I think a very good way to start the discussion is to acknowledge the fact that there's actually very little that we can prove about what nuclear deterrence does. Uh, if you look at the historical experiences since, since, the, since the Second World War, a lot is assumed is the result of nuclear deterrence, but it cannot actually be, be proven. Um, and if you, however, what you can prove and what you can measure are the consequences that use of nuclear weapons would have. What you can measure to some extent are the risks that come with nuclear deterrence and the possession of nuclear weapons, so and the practice of nuclear of nuclear deterrence. So I think the discussion that needs to be had in order to move forward is to have a discussion that weighs what is assumed that nuclear deterrence does against uh, the risks and consequences that the practice of nuclear deterrence brings. Uh, and the situation today with nine nuclear armed states and multiple interconnected deterrence relationships lots of conflicts uh, going on globally that involve or that potentially involve nuclear weapons. So I think it's wrong and dangerous to assume, to continue to assume uh, what nuclear deterrence uh, does and achieves and how effective it is uh, when we actually do not really know. Um, and I think that's a discussion that needs to be had and it's a discussion that should be much more inclusive and broad. And I think that's what the TPNW stands for, is a call from the vast majority of non-nuclear weapon states, because they would also be at the receiving end of consequences and risks, uh, that they have a stake in this discussion. Uh, so it's not merely a national security matter of a number of countries. It is a global issue. 
and uh, everybody has a global stake in it. So this discussion that need that I'm I'm, uh, I'm convinced that this discussion needs to be had in a much more inclusive way than what we've had in the past in order to move forward as an international community. I just wanted to respond to, to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kement. And I think, uh, Professor Takur, you also requested the floor. So I will continue with you. And after you, I will give uh, the floor to uh, Professor Yamaguchi if he has, wants to add something. So first, Professor Takur, please. Thank you, Mr. Shikawa. Uh, I was going to keep quiet after the first round, but the second intervention by Ambassador Week, I, I think I have to respond. Uh, th there's lots of things that we could discuss, but let me make two very quick points. Firstly, his second intervention, in fact, gets to the nub, the very heart of the debate. And that is a fundamental contradiction in every country that has the bomb and every country that shelters under the nuclear umbrella. If deterrence works, if in fact the bomb is effective in enhancing your security to a point that is more than the risks that go with it, then of course, we should encourage every other country to get it. We should facilitate them getting it. The most conflict prone region in the whole world since the Second World War has been the Middle East. Why don't we encourage and facilitate Iran getting the bomb? so we can have a more stable peace through nuclear deterrence. We know the answer to that, and that is we know that in fact, everyone's security will be degraded rather than enhanced. That contradiction cannot be resolved. And it ties into the second point which I want to make. And that is, we've now had the NPT in force for 50 years. Not a single nuclear warhead has been dismantled under the auspices of the NPT. Not a single multilateral disarmament conference has ever been convened under the auspices of the NPT. So this is like waiting for Godot. And this sense of exasperation combined with the rising alarm at the growing risks is what has led us to the ban treaty. It is simply not enough to use the same language and permanently to defer and postpone until all the conditions are right in the world. And then when we don't need it, we'll finally get nuclear disarmament. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Taku. You really introduced very profound uh, elements here, uh, particularly all this contradiction and also what the 50 years of the history of NPT tells us. So I think, uh, Professor Yamaguchi, I think yeah. you also uh, wished to respond. Yeah. Please. Yeah, uh, um, I, um, let me give you uh, two, two news, uh, good one and bad one. Uh, actually, we are now much less uh, reliant on nuclear weapons uh, in this region. Uh, particularly if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, Korean Peninsula, in 90, early 1990s, uh, U.S. Uh, decided to withdraw nuclear weapons uh, because U.S. and Korean, U.S. South Korean uh, alliance was confident that uh, on their conven conventional forces. Uh, while uh, in the 1980s, up until 1980s, the, uh, they are not confident uh, on their own conventional forces. And also, uh, from South Korean point of view, South Koreans are totally deterred uh, by North Koreans, not by nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, the long range artillery aiming at uh, aiming at Seoul uh, two uh, thousands of uh, long range artillery and short range missiles uh, with conventional uh, warheads are aiming at um, is, uh, Seoul uh, so every time something happens uh, North Korea um, would say uh, no uh, Seoul is going to be fire uh, sea of fire uh, so uh, we are not uh, uh, pretty much uh, dependent on nuclear weapons at all and bad news in Europe after the Cold War ended, before the Cold, uh, during the Cold War, Russia had no first use uh, uh, strategy. But uh, after Cold War ended, uh, Russia started to to say that if we are attacked by uh, any kind of uh, forces uh, because of uh, the vulnerability of Russia, Russia has right to use nuclear weapons uh, first. So that is bad news. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Professor Yamaguchi. Uh, I think with your second intervention, you also introduced a very important point regarding the security situation, the reality in Northeast Asia in particular, uh, involving nuclear weapons, uh, both from like kind of NPT uh, nuclear weapon states like Russia, but also, well, the how to describe North Korea, maybe again, the matter of debate, but a country like North Korea, which said they are going out of North Korea, out of NPT, developing nuclear weapons and continue to do so. So there are also this reality that this region is facing. And I'm, I'm particularly grateful for Professor Yamaguchi to bring in, into, in this aspect into question of the debate. Uh, and I can just throw in my own experience of having been following the North Korean development of its nuclear weapons and its history of nuclear activities. So time and again, the international community tried to persuade North Korea not to pursue militarization of the nuclear capability. Like 1990s, there was still belief that North Korea might refrain from going into nuclear weapons option, although it was already conducting nuclear activities. By the early 2000s, they already de developed nuclear weapons, but they did not declare it openly for some time. And there were still negotiations like six party talks. But then after the first test and in the recent years, it is developing and openly kind of uh, publicizing its capability, both nuclear weapons and missiles. So this is the reality that this region faces. And I see one hand raised uh, from Ambassador Abe. Ambassador Abe, if you, you can take the floor, please go on. I wish to uh, raise this question. The argument goes that uh, you need a nuclear deterrence. Therefore, you're in NATO, you're under the nuclear umbrella. Therefore, you cannot join the a banned treaty. But, but now uh, Austria joined because it's uh, in NATO. Other countries, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, are also not members of the NATO. Uh, why haven't they joined the banned treaty? What the situation? And it also, I'm very interested in, in the situation. Kazakhstan and New Zealand have joined the ban treaty. Kazakhstan is a member of another security treaty, in a way under Russian nuclear umbrella. New Zealand is another uh, ally of the United States. So that showed that uh, even allies with the nuclear umbrella could join the TPNW. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Abe. I think uh, uh, Mr. Rolf Nickel, I think you uh, asked the questions by chat function. Okay, th thank you very much for this very interesting debate uh, and from different viewpoints. I've actually one, one question, um, especially to, to the practitioners. Uh, how relevant is the distinction between nuclear weapons and conventional weapons in the light of um, yeah, precision guided weapons, huge payloads, uh, prompt global strike. Is this, is this still relevant and what does it mean for, for, for the debate? And since I have the, since I have the microphone, <laughs> I would also add another question, which is, um, we have, uh, of course, extended de deterrence, nuclear deterrence in Europe. Is there a scenario possible in which we can negotiate these weapons away against Russian uh, concessions um, in, in, the, in the nuclear field? Is this, a, is this an option or is it not an option? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Nickel. Uh, I see another raised hand on the screen. Uh, Mr. Hiroaki Nakanishi. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thinking about the nuclear risk reduction, uh, how can, especially nuclear, non 
nuclear weapon states like Japan and Germany, two other countries, of course, uh, to incorporate the chi China and Russia on this debate, especially and uh, how can and um, convince China to expand the transparency, or also how uh, can Russia to elaborate more on their nuclear doctrines, uh, more you know for the maybe the countries facing their I mean, threats. So that is my question. So if you have a, a idea, I'm highly appreciate on also maybe uh, intangement issue, like already raised by the uh, ambassador, but, but uh, I also curious about the, this kind of potential additional or unintended cons conflict uh, escalation. Uh, it is discussed in the Asian Pacific I mean, nowadays. So uh, in this regard, I want to ask uh, any uh, speakers on possible solutions or ideas to bridge between nuclear bomb states and non-nuclear bomb states discuss all these kind of points. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Very much for this uh, wonderful conference, uh, which I am privileged to be able to take part in. And I have a comment to make. Uh, that is, I believe that, of course, it is very good to talk and to discuss and to look at all the different possibilities. But I believe nothing will really change unless we empower the United Nations by especially Germany taking legislative action to start the process of the transition toward genuine collective security and disarmament. At the end of the Cold War and the removal of the threat of communism, there had been high hopes that a new world order would bring peace and finally get the UN system of collective security, which till then had existed only on paper being put into practice. I think uh, it is uh, very important to take a look at constitutional peace provisions like uh, the Japanese Article 9, uh, the German Article 24, the Italian Article 11, the Danish Article 20, the French Article, etc., and really start getting into some kind of legislative action to empower the United Nations, which at present has no sovereign authority on its own. And I think unless we get into that process of the transition, uh, Article 106 of the UN Charter is relevant here. I don't think anything will change and we will not accomplish anything. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we had from the audience uh, quite a number of questions and comments. Some of them are more specific and specifically addressed to some speakers. Some others are quite general. So what I would like to do is to ask the four speakers to address any of the questions or comments, maybe specifically addressed to them or not specifically addressed to them, and wrap up this session. So. I think, uh, Mr. Kement, you raised your hands first while I was thinking to whom I should uh, give the floor first. So, yes, please go ahead. Uh, I would like to address the question asked by Ambassador Abe. That was a point very important for Austria in the TBNW negotiations to make sure that NATO membership as such is not incompatible with joining the TBNW. What is, of course, prohibited by the TPNW is the stationing of uh, nuclear weapons from another country in one's territory. But in the North Atlantic Treaty itself, uh, it says nothing about nuclear weapons. So joining the TPNW, and I'm under no illusion that that will happen anytime soon, but joining the TPNW as such is not incompatible with the treaty. What would have to be done is to disassociate uh, oneself from the nuclear aspects of NATO, which are, um, of course, uh, political uh, uh, 
decisions taken by NATO, but not as such in the treaty itself. So it is possible to do it if uh, NATO countries uh, want to join. Uh, there's nothing per se to stop them. Uh, the question was also on the situation of uh, Sweden and Switzerland. Sweden was, and that was actually uh, became public knowledge, Sweden was very proactively pressured and it was threatened to be the cooperation, the defense cooperation with NATO uh, was put into question if Sweden would join. In Switzerland, the government has taken a decision uh, uh, not to join the TPNW at the moment, but parliament, as far as I know, uh, has requested uh, uh, a, a process to revisit uh, this. I think the debate is ongoing. Uh, I mean, the treaty is is very young and the idea behind the treaty is to uh, is to get the discussion uh, going in uh, many countries so it's a vibrant discussion and we see that also uh, here today so um, uh, it's it's a it's a dynamic process and uh, uh, it's also a dynamic process in countries like sweden and, and uh, switzerland New Zealand uh, um, uh, has joined the TPNW and, and uh, as such is not under the uh, extended uh, nuclear deterrence uh, as far as I'm aware. It's a uh, very strongly held uh, uh, national position of New Zealand, but uh, maybe people closer to New Zealand uh, know that better. But as far as I know, that is uh, um, a very strong political priority for New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kment. And I see Professor Takur raising your hand. So first Professor Takur, and then Professor Yamaguchi, and then Ambassador Viek, in that order. Thank please. you. Professor Takur, Thank please go you. ahead. Three, three quick responses. One, following up on the last thing from Alexander, uh, response to Ambassador Abe. New Zealand went through a, a very strong anti-nuclear phase in the 1980s, as a result of which the Americans effectively said, We've part company as allies. The ANZUS Alliance will effectively now be bilateral between the United States and Australia, and New Zealand will remain a valued friend, but no longer an ally. Subsequent, subsequent to that, New Zealand actually passed an anti-nuclear uh, legislation, the 30th anniversary of which was last year or 2017. I, I went and gave a keynote lecture. Under New Zealand national law, it is simply not possible for New Zealand to take part in any nuclear uh, activity, even for uh, with another country. So there is nothing in the ban treaty that now contradicts, and a lot of it, in fact, validates the New Zealand national law. Similarly with Australia, as uh, Ambassador Mint was saying, there's nothing in the ANZUS treaty proper that requires Australia to have any nuclear arrangement in practice uh, with the United States. But around the treaty, Arrangements now do have that, and as a result of that, politically, it will be difficult for Australia to sign. Having said that, let me also add, as Ambassador and Abe, Abe and I have discussed on many occasions, with Japan, there's nothing even in practice that runs against anything from the ban treaty. So Japan, as far as I can tell, could sign the treaty and not have anything in contradiction with existing uh, alliance obligation, either in theory or in practice, one. Second, in response to Ambassador Nickel, technological developments have blurred the distinctions between nuclear on the one hand and conventional space, cyber, artificial uh, intelligence domains, etc. And as a result of that, allied to the fact that we have seen a normalization of the discourse of nuclear weapons use by Russia, by North Korea, uh, by Pakistan, uh, by India. It became that much more important to reaffirm the sharp normative boundary between nuclear weapons and conventional weapons. And the ban treaty does that. So yes, what he said was factually and empirically correct, but one of the great advantages of the ban treaty is it reinserts a hard normative boundary between nuclear weapons and all other weapons and says nuclear weapons are unacceptable under any circumstances by anyone ever, period. 
no ifs, no buts. So that was very important. Finally, uh, Mr. Nakanishi, uh, the point about China. At some stage, we are going to have to bring China into multilateral arms, nuclear arms control negotiations. But their argument, which is very difficult to disagree with, is that the difference in numbers between them on the one hand and Russia and the United States that still have more than 90% of global stockpiles, that difference is so big that once the Russians and the Americans come down to comparable numbers, then the Chinese might be interested in joining. Until then, uh, they are not interested. So I think other things, transparency, et cetera, I agree, but there is merit to that Chinese argument on that basis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Taku. Uh, so now I give the floor to Professor Yamaguchi. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just uh, to to answer the question, the very technical one, um, distinction between nuclear and conventional forces. Um, now, conventional fo force, forces are very much are very much uh, effective. Uh, pressure guided uh, guided munition is pretty much uh, the effective, and the warheads, uh, warheads of uh, most of uh, pressure guided munitions, the bombs are uh, something like 450 kilograms or 500 kilograms uh, for uh, cruise missiles or for ballistic missiles as, as well. And that means the 0 0.5 kiloton is uh, uh, the, uh, robust enough to, to destroy most of that uh, military target. Um, if you look at the uh, Hiroshima bomb uh, bombing, it, uh, the bomb uh, used was uh, 16 kiloton. Uh, a kiloton, 16 kiloton is a huge, um, a huge bomb to burn, burn all the uh, uh, city of Hiroshima. Uh, but the 500 ki kilogram, uh, 0 0.5 uh, uh, kiloton uh, uh, is um, is uh, good enough to destroy most of the uh, buildings or something like that. So if uh, um, um, the, if you look at the Korean situation. Um, the, the 450 kilogram bombs, uh, maybe three, uh, three to two to three thousand uh, uh, bombs by U.S. and uh, um, the Korea uh, can destroy most of the the, the targets in, in North Korea. That was a calculation uh, in 2016. Uh, it was not the case in 1992. Uh, there was no such a thing as a pressure guided mission uh, to wipe out uh, conventional forces in um, in North Korea. And, uh, so uh, basically nations, uh, militaries are uh, um, giving up, giving, uh, giving up uh, uh, operational nuclear weapons uh, um, because uh, they, they don't have to, to depend on uh, operational nuclear weapons. Um, for nuclear deterrence, uh, strategic nuclear balance uh, is very, very important. Uh, but uh, my point is, the strategic nuclear balance for nuclear uh, nuclear deterrence is not everything. Uh, we need to think about uh, a broader aspect of security. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yamaguchi. Uh, so, Ambassador Vieck, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, let me come back to a couple of questions on uh, Mr. Kmenit. Uh, there's no proof of the effectiveness of the nuclear deterrent. Well, I think that um, scientific proofs and it's difficult to deliver them in politics in general. Uh, but I would say there are some indications uh, that apparent, apparently nuclear deterrence has worked in the past. If you look at uh, uh, Europe during the Cold War or even in general that since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we had no uh, nuclear strike. So apparently there, must, there is some uh, effectiveness. On Professor Takur, the fundamental contradiction, I couldn't agree more. Uh, that there is, there are fundamental contradictions underlying the nuclear deterrence uh, rationale. Um, I wouldn't say that this is an argument for saying it's it's not effective. It is effective, but it has its contradictions. In particular, as you said, uh, in the way that uh, we treat uh, regions uh, with um, powers that want to become nuclear and we want to prevent them. So there are underlying contradictions, and that is exactly why we are committed to the long-term goal of a nuclear-free world. So we are, not, uh, we are not happy with the status quo. We have the nuclear deterrent. We use it. We think it's effective. But nevertheless, we want to reduce the role of nuclear weapons and, and seize every opportunity in order to go along that path. Which brings me to Ambassador Abe's question uh, about um, uh, the ban treaty and why did we not sign 
uh, we did not uh, uh, refrain from signing uh, because we uh, are living under the nuclear umbrella. We did not sign because we are simply not convinced uh, that this is uh, the right approach. Um, so it's uh, um, uh, this ban treaty, in fact, tries to take the shortcut. Uh, and uh, we don't think that will, it will have the desired effect. Uh, so that's why initially I said we have to work for behavioral changes uh, of the nuclear powers in order to give, uh, not only to address the symptoms as the ban treaty, but to go to the uh, underlying reasons, to the roots of uh, why we have nuclear powers. Um, to um, the question of Rolf Nickel regarding uh, the potential review of the extended nuclear deterrence of NATO if Russia uh, makes concessions in the nuclear field. Well, first of all, I would say uh, we have to look at the concessions that Russia would make. And secondly, I have to admit that Russia is not the only nuclear threat that NATO uh, is dealing with in its uh, nuclear deterrence uh, policy. And finally, a word on uh, cooperating China and Russia in this debate. Yes, indeed, that's exactly what we have to do. Uh, unintended escalation, I think, is uh, the major threat. If we look at the Straits of Taiwan, if we look at the Baltic Sea, uh, the, the, simply the risk of unintended escalation is uh, too huge. Uh, and that's why we have to go for confidence building measures for for arrangements, uh, for more transparency with exercises, for mutual invitations uh, to exercises, for exchanges on uh, doctrines. So the whole package of con confidence building measures, in the end, uh, confidence and trust will uh, pave the way towards uh, reducing the role uh, of nuclear weapons in international relations. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, after such kind of intensive and very informative and uh, illuminating debates among these, these four distinguished speakers, I don't even try to summarize this session. Uh, just let me say that I think this debate continuing from the yesterday's one was really timely, very profound in nature, very broad in its spectrum. And I'm sure that, you know, I can represent all the audience uh, if I say that I really enjoyed this discussion. We learned a lot from your debates. And I think you, among yourselves, among four speakers, you really kind of discussed very broad and profound uh, consequences and uh, kind of deep thinking through all these matters. And particularly at this juncture of TPNW and NPT, I think this was really a useful debate to have. Thank you very much for all the speakers and thank you for the audiences for asking very insightful questions and comments. And with that uh, word, I would like to conclude this session too that I was very honored and very glad to uh, chair. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>